they are a thousand times older than man. They've survived global cladicisms, outlived dinosaurs, and possibly, in the future, will be the last living creatures on the planet. They are hardy, unpretentious, and seem to be completely eradicable. You think, yes, I've destroyed them, destroyed, and then you look, and they are here again, who knows where from? They originate from the tropics and have settled in the concrete jungle of cities. Now they are urban insects. Who got residents in megacities? And how can a tiny creature survive in a big city? Modern cities are like giant anthills. The endless traffic and hustle reigning in the streets. A huge number of people living in closed cells of apartments. Everybody is busy with something, in a hurry, and not noticing that under their feet there is another life actively going. There are two types, generally speaking, synanthropic insects living with the human. These are the ones who directly use us, parasites us in one form or another, and those who have just found suitable living conditions. After all, out of those millions of species of insects, some are very comfortable living in the city. Urban insects build their colonies and adapt to life in megacities. These tiny but brave inhabitants conquer each other's city territories and even people have to share their homes with them. All insects living with humans are usually tropical ones and always live at above zero temperatures. These are favorable conditions for them. Humans, respectively, also create an above zero temperature for them. And accordingly, these conditions begin to be populated by tropical insect species. These small inhabitants of apartments have long taken urban living space. The small red pharaoh's ant is well known for being one of the most vulnerable and ineradicable household pests. About 200 years ago, dwellers of European cities didn't even know about the existence of this insect. That was until one day when tiny ants sneaked on merchant ships along with the cargo. That was how the march of the thermophilic insect around the planet started. It was called pharaohs because it was first discovered during the excavations of the Egyptian pyramids. In the middle of the 19th century, the pharaoh ant moved from hot Egypt to England. And from there, with goods and luggage, it traveled to settle down on all five continents. Red ants live in our forests as well, but the difference between the two species, forest and household insects, is huge. The red forest ant is twice the size of the household one. This gives the small pharaoh's ants an advantage in populating any, even the most cramped, urban premises. Forest ants are famous for their outstanding construction abilities. They erect anthills up to two meters high. The household ants aren't notable for any creative activity. They don't build anthills. But on the other hand, having adopted to life in urban conditions, they show fantastic resourcefulness in choosing a place for residents. For pharaoh's ants to create a new anthill, it's enough to find a small groove in the wall, a crack in the floor, or a nook under furniture cover. The main thing they need is a secluded place, that is, a dark one, where, if possible, light doesn't go. And a place where it's humid. That's because all ants need humidity. What I mean is that they need to breathe there, in a moist environment. Therefore, they will find any moist, dark place. Naturally, the further and deeper it is from any noise, vibrations and various irritants, the better it'll be for them. Red forest ants eat pests in the forest, thereby protecting it from parasites. While household dwellers consume everything, destroying not only the edible products in the kitchen, but also toothpaste, soap, even shoe polish. If the colony is large, that is, quite developed in size already, then in general, they can afford to eat something not so suitable, let's say. What I mean is that in future, if one of them dies, they'll simply understand that this cannot be eaten, and pretty much most of them will still be alive. They survive even in austere conditions. Pharaoh's ants are capable of going without food for up to eight months. Moreover, 
These city six-legged workaholics, in contrast to their forest congeners, don't fight for territory. Colonies unite and can form giant colonies consisting of millions of workers and thousands of queens. The problem with them is tremendous because it is such a diffuse colony, huge with multi-million ants. They live in cavities, in walls, somewhere in concrete. I once had a colony living in a box of floppy disks, and they were prospering until I found them. They don't show any aggression towards each other. After all, they usually say the black garden ant, for instance, there is one and only one queen. The territory is protected, and these are the ones that are absolutely devoid of aggressiveness. They have many queens, and in fact, the whole house becomes a colony of ants. They propagate at a frantic pace, and very soon, a giant ant city megapolis has grown inside a house. And in your apartment, you can fight as long as you want. You kill some foragers, and a million new ones will come to take their place. Although intrigue and political games are not in the nature of ants, some can show certain manifestations of these. Red forest ants tend to usurp power. A young queen of this species cannot build an anthill of her own. Therefore, she finds orphaned colonies of different species and replaces the lost queen. In this case, the ants of the enslaved colony serve the alien queen properly until the queen's offspring replaces them. But for the red urban ant, the reproducing female ant is not at all the queen. Workers can easily kill her if she doesn't meet their expectations or send her away to a neighboring anthill. If you're lucky to catch one of these queens and kill it, the colony won't die because of it. They'll have 40 more queens, which will reproduce just as well. In all ant colonies, there is a strict division of labor. Every individual has a certain profession. Some take care of the offspring, others clean the territory, and others find food. There are ants which are builders, scouts, soldiers. All these are workers, and the anthill is ruled by the queen, the reproducing ant, which lays eggs all her life, ensuring the growth of the colony. Moving into the city, ants keep the complex structure of their social life. They learn to populate new territories unusual for them. For example, here's the black garden ant. You think a completely wild species, and then you see ants getting out of from cracks into the asphalt. This is because the warm asphalt is just perfect for them to build their anthiops and heat them with the sun rays. Where in the wild, where are they going to find such flat stones which are so good? And here's asphalt. Welcome. Another thing is that, of course, they are crushed by passerbys, but somehow they find places where they can live. It has become a fashionable hobby to observe ant colonies in urban conditions. Small anthills are placed in hermetic transparent plastic containers. People create the atmosphere favorable for ants and observe how the ant colony grows and develops. It is interesting because they develop. What I mean is that you, for example, take a small colony and it grows in front of your eyes. That is, you participate in this process. You feed them, you look after them, and they develop in quantity. You observe the whole process. What happens inside an ant farm is a reduced copy of the life of these insects in a large anthill. To see this is like looking into the keyhole of an anthill. Every ant performs its functions. There are soldiers, there are scouts, there are nannies. You can observe all of this. And it's quite interesting. And moreover, it's soothing. That is, people very often buy it for the office, to put it on a desk, and to periodically have a break from work. We took one ant colony for some time too, and did an experiment to check their adaptation to urban conditions. These insects had emerged from the pupae and had been growing in overprotected conditions of the ant farm. Therefore, everything they encountered within the experiment was new to them. What kind of city is it if there's no garbage there? First of all, we gave them an empty soda can and some scraps of paper. The first daredevils set off immediately to study the new objects. To study whether it is possible to live here or whether it can be eaten. These are the two options. And whether it threatens them. What I mean is that if initially it doesn't threaten them with anything, they'll see what can be done with it. Here the can is explored by a scout. Most likely the ants will perceive it as a source of sugar, which they'll find inside the can in the remains of sweet soda. They can drink it quite well because it contains sugar. They drink sweet syrup, eat sweet fruit, so sugar-containing food is quite suitable for them. 
Well, the ants started drinking the harmful soda straight away. Let's see how they'll react to unhealthy fast food, which is so popular among city dwellers. Chicken nuggets, potato chips, and sweet cornflakes go to the anthill. Insects are likely to be much more resistant to any food that we consider harmful, tasteless. That's because their generations change quickly, while we accumulate all of this. Accumulate all this chemistry for years. And what is it for an ant? He lived, lived his short life and died. Others replaced him. I think that insects are more resistant in this respect. The smallest and fastest representatives of the ant colony are scouts. They are the first to try nuggets and apparently inform the others that the food is quite edible. They don't just say about it when they go back. They, on their way back, they leave a trace of smell behind them. And the others, they just follow this trail, straight along the trail. Even if the trail is meandering, they won't get confused. They won't get lost. They'll come straight to the food, though they've never been there. There are more and more ants near the nuggets. Apparently, they like this kind of food. Some even bite off quite large chunks and take it with them. Perhaps it'll take it to the anthill, because not all ants go out to eat. It's only a certain part of the ants that leave the anthill. There are two options. Either they store food in themselves and, going back, feed the others who don't go out. This is usually nannies, the queen itself, that is, they are inside. And they don't leave the anthill when there is no urgent need for it. Accordingly, here they either eat to the full or take a piece right there inside the anthill. And there, accordingly, we'll be able to give it to those ants that are inside. And now a bigger ant joins the feast. Most likely, it's a soldier. They are not likely to play a defensive role in this case, but a function of a large refrigerator, a stock of food. What I mean is that they store food in themselves, here, in this abdomen, and they have two stomachs there. One stomach is their own, that is, they store food for themselves, eat it, and the second stomach is just like a storage place. That is, they store all this food inside themselves in case, when they are inside the anthill, that is, they come later and sit in the anthill until one of those ants inside comes up to them and asks them to feed them. As for chips and cornflakes, we made a mistake, giving them to ants as they were. This food was too dry for them, so it didn't even interest them. They don't care if it's fried food, boiled food. The main thing for them is that there are proteins, there are carbohydrates, there is water, there are fats. And therefore, such flexibility about food, that is, it doesn't matter whether it's of animal origin or vegetable origin. They are ready to eat all of this. Which is confirmed by our experiment. Ants fearlessly tried everything that appeared in their anthill. They carefully examined all new items, including a piece of brick. And they showed no signs of excitement and discontent. Which can mean only one thing. Even spoiled farm ants are quite ready to populate the urban jungle. I just hope they won't escape from their farmhouse. Otherwise, from nice pets, they will immediately turn into intrusive and maybe dangerous pests. beginning of the 21st century, alien insects appeared in Russian cities, and in just a few years, they've turned into real trouble. Bed bugs in Moscow are a problem now. If not the most important one, then definitely number one. These bugs have been imported mainly from South Central Asia. In 2010, the Federal Service for Consumer Rights Protection and Human Welfare gave data informing that in Moscow alone, the number of so-called bedbugs is almost doubling every year. The problem is still to be solved. One female bug is enough. A female that has sucked enough blood, this is enough for the object to be infected. When you have people from South Asia, who come to do some construction work or remodeling work for you. That's it. It's like saying hello to all the bedbugs. 
And that's, that's what happens. All the hospitals that have been renovated by the people from Southeast Asia are infected. Hospitals, offices, five-star hotels. So, there are enough problems. You arrive to such a hotel, put your bag there for a couple of days, and welcome to the world of bedbugs. The unpleasant experience of living next to these bloodsuckers is a sure thing for the hotel guest, outside the hotel as well. Either a person has brought the bedbugs himself and populated the hotel with them, or, accordingly, there is already a locus appearing there. Or vice versa, a person from a hotel room brings them into his private apartment or house. And it all migrates, just like in nature. It always happens, and therefore it is very difficult to track all this. Even experienced Moscow biologists admit that they don't remember such an invasion of bedbugs in the capital region. You can find an object for entomological study right on the street. Here is a scientist. What can he find? I found a good chair in the garbage. I thought I'd take it to the apiary. That was what I needed. I took it and put it in the car right away. And something. This was such a greasy chair. I sniffed at it and took the seat off with this screwdriver. Oh my God! I've never seen such bed bugs. Huge, blood-sucked bugs the size of a berry. Urban conditions are ideal for bed bugs. In the apartments, the temperature is constant without sharp changes. The humidity is optimal too. There are plenty of nooks. Bed bugs, firstly, are very secretive insects that are nocturnal. That is, they are constantly hiding in any cracks, nooks of any size. This is achieved thanks to their shape. They are flattened, very flat and able to get even in a closed book in the folded sheets of paper. And most importantly, there is always a source of food nearby, humans. After one nourishing dinner of human blood, the female bug lays about 20 eggs, and during a year of its life, about 500. Moreover, there can be many females in the nidus, and even small colonies of bed bugs turn into hordes very quickly. It is not easy to destroy them. Bed bugs aren't afraid of freezing. Some storage pests say, the grain month, that sort of thing. It is enough to simply freeze it, and that's it. And the common moth, which feeds on fur coats, can be frozen to death. As for bed bugs, no, you can't do it. These are nidus parasites. They can sit perfectly, waiting for their host, the feeder in the most severe frost, even for years. And even chemical disinfection of the house against bedbugs doesn't guarantee their complete extermination. Not all the poisons that can kill these parasites are able to penetrate the shell of the insect eggs. Therefore, even after such disinfection, they can appear again very quickly or move to a next door apartment. The Moscow Disinfection Center's Biocontrol Laboratory insectariums are swarming with harmful insects, although here they do more good rather than harm. Cockroaches, fleas, bedbugs, mosquitoes, and other six-legged animals are specially bred for experiments. These typical urban dwellers are used to test the effectiveness of pest control products. In our laboratory, cockroaches propagated here, in such a container. The container is open, but despite the fact that it is open, no cockroach can creep out from here. It's because the walls are smeared with petroleum jelly, and cockroaches cannot crawl over petroleum jelly. Although their legs are equipped with special devices enabling them to crawl on smooth surfaces, petroleum jelly becomes impassable for them. The German cockroach appeared in megapolises in Russia in the 18th century. It was called a Prusak because people believed that it had been brought by soldiers returning to Russia from Prussia after the Seven Years' War, a major military conflict between the two coalitions for hegemony in Europe. However, in West Germany, this cockroach is called a Frenchman, and in East Germany, a Russian. Moreover, scientists disagree about its true origin, either Africa or South Asia. Not that it matters now, though. With the help of humans, the German cockroach has spread throughout the whole planet. In each of these bottles, there are two to 3,000 German cockroaches. This amount would be enough to densely populate a whole skyscraper with them. But from a scientific point of view, it's not very many.
For example, about one and a half thousand cockroaches are used to conduct registration tests for one contact insecticide. To conduct a comprehensive test and study all the insecticidal properties of one substance or another. For the last few years, many have been asking the same question. Where have cockroaches from city apartments gone? Switching on the light in the kitchen, people no longer see hurrying, escaping German cockroaches. You can be as careless as to leave a plate of cookies on the table for a whole night. You might think that now you can give a sigh of relief. Finally, these unpleasant pests no longer bother you. However, there's something preventing city dwellers from enjoying this freedom. It is their own fate and not one of the cockroaches that worries them. Can people feel in complete safety in buildings which even insects leave? There are many different theories offering regarding why cockroaches have disappeared. Some people blame high-frequency electromagnetic radiation. Stuffed with all kinds of equipment, apartment buildings are now unsuitable for insects to live in. Other researchers are convinced that cockroaches were poisoned with genetically modified food from the human table. Some biologists believe that cockroaches couldn't tolerate modern plastic, which put them off with its sharp smell. Another hypothesis, cockroaches could not stand competition with household ants which appeared to be stronger and made the rivals flee. However, none of these theories has received scientific proof yet. Moreover, entomologists assure us that cockroaches were, are, and will be our city neighbors. The cockroaches haven't gone anywhere. Their number has significantly reduced, but the problem is still there. Small inhabitants of the basement on the premises of one of the metropolitan enterprises are agitated today by an unexpected visit. People in protective suits and masks have brought death with them. The city disinfection center's employees will be destroying insects. The exterminators disinfect virtually every crack. Look into the most secluded nooks so that the pests have nowhere to hide and nowhere to escape. Applying the method of cold mist, they spray the aqueous solution of poisonous concentrate. For every room and premises, substances to use are selected individually. You cannot use one and the same substance, otherwise there will be no result. They develop resistance, so to speak, to this insecticide. What I mean is that the insects get used to it. Increasing the amount of insecticide doesn't solve the problem. The most favorite place of basement cockroaches is ventilation chambers. Conditions there are ideal for life of the German cockroaches. Warm and humid enough, and even the strongest poison won't destroy the insects once and forever in such premises. It's a challenging task to invent a poison which kills insects and not humans because insects are much more resistant to any exposure. If cockroaches choose some premises, then it's next to impossible to evict them from there. Whatever the exterminators use to destroy these red inhabitants, they may return there after some time. They are afraid of neither poisonous attacks nor starvation. Under adverse conditions, cockroaches are able to eat plastic in search of alternative food. And this, so to say, their biological inclination creates this desire of cockroaches to populate any object and survive in the most unfavorable conditions. This very fact that even such inedible food does not kill cockroaches speaks for the incredible vitality of this species of insects. It is possible that in the future, evolution will change cockroaches' food cravings and they'll learn to digest both plastic and rubber and any other artificial material pretty well. At this stage, cockroaches, of course, aren't able to survive eating only plastic. It's just their attempt to adapt. This is a biological inclination. Entomologists believe that only those insects that will learn to use artificial substitutes in their lives will be able to survive in the cities of the future. After all, in megapolises, there are less and less natural materials. And while cockroaches are only trying plastic for taste, some insects have already fully adapted to it. The gluttonous moth added plastic bags containing foodstuff to its diet. In its stomach, there are bacteria reproducing, able to digest polyethylene, 
perhaps this is a peculiar technology of the future, a new way of non-waste recycling of plastic products. Such gluttony of the moth is even beneficial for humans. Having said that, the common cloth moth sticks to its traditional food preferences and happily eats expensive and so delicious fur coats which we keep in our wardrobes. By the way, this is solely moth larvae that do it. Moth larvae have also tasted imitation fur coat. It's only that they cannot survive on a synthetic diet yet. They eat them, but they don't eat their fill. Moth larvae can't have it, then no one will. They've ruined imitation fur coats, but went hungry anyways. They're bugs. They have to eat something. It's quite interesting because imitation fur coat smells completely different than the natural one. And it must be some visual preference that plays a key role here. The moth cares about food. That's why it eats imitation fur coats out of hunger. It's not only household insects, but street insects as well, that master the peculiarities of urban life. For the green lungs of the capital, that is, parks, gardens, and avenues, bees and bumblebees are vital. They are the only intermediaries in the cross-pollination of trees and plants. Carrying pollen from one flower to another, bumblebees and bees do not only help blossom and developing fruit on trees, but also revitalize city vegetation. However, the city has its influence on these insects too. We've often seen that if bees built their nests in enclosed balconies, we've seen various composite materials brought by bees to strengthen their nests. They were synthetic balms of various types, such tar as those used in construction sites, for example. Urban bees have adapted some variety in the assortment of materials they use to help them survive in the megapolis. Artificial sealants, plasticine and chewing gum were added to it. It seems to be an instinctive activity on the one hand, but on the other, it allows for this kind of flexibility. Bees substitute polyurethane sealant for pine resin, which they usually use in the construction of hives. Just like people insulate windows with plastic sealants, bees seal seams in their nests to fight drafts. But the most surprising thing is that the insects first recycle this plastic like they would do with natural wax. They chew the sealant and sometimes pieces of plastic bags and then spit them out like chewing gum. And with this plastic sealant, they insulate their hives. With the claws of their legs, they take it from their sternites, pass them up to other bees, and those at the place where they need to contract with the help of these plates, process it with their jaws, chew it. At the same time, add the enzyme dissolving wax to attach it. Nowadays, bees live in almost every major city. Humans willingly provide bee colonies with civilized habitation, comfortable hives which are put in urban parks. In principle, here is our honeybee. It is, of course, considered a domesticated animal, but it's rather an administrative step so that it's possible to nail thieves if a beehive is stolen, that it is not wild. But in principle, if you now release a bee swarm into the wild and there is a good hollow tree, then the bee will live the way it has always lived. Even on the balconies of residential high-rise buildings, bees feel at home. Moreover, the presence of people doesn't bother them at all. Once in Moscow, an international scandal almost happened over a bee swarm, which chose an improper place for residents. Bees settled in the top of a column in the private residence of the American ambassador. Where did the swarm come from? Well, probably there was some kind of apiotherapy, and it was quite high there, and the bee's flight path just passed near the balcony where the ambassador and his wife like to relax. And if a bee stings, it's already an international scandal, and they made me destroy these bees. They gave me a canister of diclofos, some plaster, well, I sprayed it all over, insulated all the openings. Well, I betrayed my own, how do I put it, my entomological conscience. Bees are one of the few insects that don't parasitize city dwellers. This is a kind of mutually beneficial cooperation. Urban beekeepers help bees survive in cold and starvation periods. Bees, on their part, in addition to cross-pollination, collect honey, which, according to experts, is not worse than a country product. Here, we should make it clear, make an approximation that the quality of honey produced in urban conditions, in case it is only obtained from the floral source, it can even be better in quality in view of numerical characteristics.
Unlike bees, bumblebees don't store honey, but the city needs these insects no less. Bumblebees cope with cross-pollination of flowers and trees much better. Therefore, it is them who are the best workers in the natural gardening of the concrete jungle. However, the number of bumblebee families in modern cities is decreasing every year. In nature, they hibernate in mice burrow, while in residential areas in cracks of old wooden buildings. But in urban conditions, they have problems with finding any of them. In the city, we've covered everything with asphalt. No mice, very few, that they are there in the ground. There are no voles here, almost nothing. And there is another factor. The ecology is bad enough. A huge amount of contagion and parasites. And many bumblebees, simply accumulating all this over the summer, then cannot survive the winter and die. Because of this, there is a constant reduction in the number of these urban insects. The reduction in the number of bumblebees can eventually cause disease and the disappearance of plants that they won't be able to pollinate. This is a real problem for concrete and glass cities. The solution for this problem might be bumblebee farms. This is a unique bumblebee farm. There are only two of these in Russia. You'll never see so many bumblebees at the same time in nature. They are bred to work in gardens and greenhouses. It is bumblebees that help grow greenhouse vegetables. If it weren't for these furry insects, then the deficit of local cucumbers, especially in winter, would be a sure thing for city dwellers. However, within the several years of bumblebee farming, an unexpected side effect was discovered. Healthy, strong bumblebee queens began to reproduce actively with new colonies settling around the parent's nest slowly moving to cities. There is an opinion that bumblebees steal honey from bees and therefore they must be destroyed. This is not true. Bumblebees are even more hardworking and hardy than bees. They are not afraid of cold and cloudy weather when tender bees stay in their hives. In addition, the bumblebee has a long proboscis and can collect nectar even in deep flowers where the bee simply cannot reach. In search of food, the bumblebee flies at a speed of about 60 kilometers per hour and pollinates more than 1,000 flowers per night. Every morning at the bumblebee farm begins with an intimate process. Female bumblebees and males are put into the enclosure of the mating laboratory. This is the moment when the reproduction of future pollinators begins. Here is a selected mother. Males don't sting, unlike queens, but queens sting very well. Working on such a farm requires some courage. A rare day goes by without bumblebee stings. People work in red light with aggressive queens and working bumblebees. It disorients insects and they cannot attack. Each stage of breeding requires a separate laboratory. Here, bumblebee colonies are prepared to be relocated to their new owners. This is what a nest that hasn't been moved looks like. This is the outer box. We put syrup. Here it's about 0.8 gallons of syrup, almost 8 pounds, in the lower part. It's enough for the entire life of bumblebees. There is always access to it. That is, bumblebees throughout all the service period can safely drink the syrup. Why syrup and not pollen? Because they bring pollen from plants. And if they get pollen too, they won't work at all, but will only sit here and eat. The hard-working bumblebee colony raises the yield by 30 and sometimes 50 percent. Therefore, bumblebees grown on such a farm are like purebred horses. They are the best in their kind. Growing bumblebees here in my laboratory, I spend on their medical treatment. My bumblebees have virtually no disease. They are clean. Moreover, I breed pure lines that are genetically very strong, and I constantly do selection. I renew blood. Hence, those bumblebees which move from the farm to the city are more robust and viable. And maybe in the future, they'll also learn to survive in harsh urban conditions, like harmful insects that conquered streets and houses of megapolises have done. However, even bees and bumblebees cannot be called exclusively useful without any reservation. Apart from all benefits, they carry a threat to humans as well. Those who have experienced the bee's sting at least once know for sure what it feels like. Pain itching, burning, swelling at the sting site. When a bee stings a man, it leaves its venom sac inside, and it stays inside a human or a stung animal.
Then the venom gradually comes out and takes its effect. Few people know that 500 bee stings are fatal to humans, and this is not an unreal outcome. Bee colonies consist of thousands and even tens of thousands of bees. And if inadvertently you disturb a hive, you can provoke an attack of a whole swarm of bees. However, the most danger is the one bees and bumblebees have for allergic individuals living in the city. They can provoke allergic reactions, different types of skin rashes, bronchospasms, with the most severe one being anaphylactic shock. It's when a severe vascular reaction occurs, the blood pressure drops, and a person may lose consciousness. The anaphylactic attack shock from a bee sting can lead to the death of a person. It happens within a few minutes. The larynx swells. Breathing is difficult. There is a lack of oxygen and devascularization. Therefore, doctors insist that people with an insect allergy, that is, allergic to insects and their metabolic byproducts should always carry a special syringe with adrenaline. This is the only thing that can save their lives at a dangerous moment. Adrenaline, it is released in the form of a pen and is injected into the thigh rectus muscle, right through the clothing for an immediate effect. In medicine, the insect allergy is identified as a separate category. The culprits are not only flying insects, but crawling ones too. Mites, moth larvae, and even cockroaches. When we say cockroach, we imagine, of course, first of all, the German cockroach. A red cockroach with antennae. The disgusting creature. It doesn't seem disgusting to me, but of course it's disgusting because it crawls into food. There are lots of allergens in them. Cockroaches, like other household insects, can cause severe allergies to the allergic individual, sometimes leading to asthma. Not so dangerous, but still unpleasant, is the allergy to mosquito sting. A rare person evades the intolerable itching and blisters after meeting this tiny bloodsucker. If you see mosquitoes flying at the height of the 12-story or 9-story building in November, for example, then you have a damp basement and they have flown through the ventilation. That's it. The modern conditions of urban life lead to ordinary insects adapting, can turn into a completely new subspecies. For example, the most common mosquito squeaker, Culex pipiens. Culex pipiens has adapted to life in the basements of multi-story buildings and has become an urban mosquito. The mosquito squeaker. There is a mosquito ringer, a bloodworm. Here, this one seems to ring, and that one seems to squeak. Indeed, he has such a nasty squeaking sound of flight, and now a subspecies has developed. In fact, according to biological characteristics, even a species, let it be decided by experts. Culex pipiens molestus. A basement filled with water is the place that mosquitoes can only dream of, and their dreams come true at extraordinary pace. According to the data of 1992, the urban mosquito was spread in 300 cities of Russia. 20 years later, it can be found in almost all large settlements. And until all the basements have been put in order, his victorious procession is not under any threat. Usually, mosquitoes require several conditions for successful reproduction. A large space for swarming and mating, relatively clean ditch water, a temperature above 59 degrees Fahrenheit, and blood, which is necessary for the female to form eggs, preferably human blood. However, urban mosquitoes have settled in warm basements of multi-story buildings and greatly simplified their existence. In fact, it is adapted to having less water for the larvae, which is enough to survive. Accordingly, feeding is minimal too. What I mean is, while receiving minimum nutrition, they reach the sizes necessary for their life and turn into pupae. And accordingly, from pupae adult mosquitoes hatch. Urban mosquitoes now don't have swarming or mating dances at all. And dirty water suits well too. But most importantly, for the first offspring, they no longer need to look for an object to have a bloodthirsty bite. And this gives them a real head start for survival. Females can lay the first lane of eggs without having fed on blood. And this is an advantage in comparison to other mosquitoes that cannot lay even one egg without having had enough blood. And this, let's say, the peculiarity of this population has led to the possibility of this mosquito population to live in urban conditions. Such adaption hasn't made mosquitoes more harmless. 
and even on the contrary, they have become smarter and angrier. Molestus in Latin means intrusive, bringing anxiety, and this cannot reflect the nature of the harmful insect more accurately. They get into the highest floors through ventilation. They try to attack only at night, alone or in a pair, while the rest stay behind wardrobes and under couches. Its behavior has changed. After all, a normal honest mosquito, if it's really got on your nerves, well, you switch on the light and slap it on the ceiling. This one will never allow it. If frightened, it'll hide under the bed and stay there and perhaps even listen to breathing to be sure the human has fallen asleep and then it goes to sting. The new subspecies of mosquitoes is terribly fastidious. According to observations of entomologists, before making the main sting, the basement mosquito does several trial runs. It can buzz near your ear for hours, choosing a place for the sting, then sting slightly, and again for a long time, it'll be choosing a new landing point, and it'll go this way all night. It stings sharply and immediately flies away before the human manages to swat it. But the worst thing is that the uncleanliness makes them even more dangerous in terms of infections that they can carry. Encephalitis, the most dangerous types of fever, basement mosquitoes take their active part in their their distribution. First, we'll see how mosquitoes react to the untreated hand. This will be control data. In the biocontrol laboratory where insecticides are tested, another test is being carried out. Hardy scientists carry out experiments on themselves. Sergei Pugayev is testing the effectiveness of a new mosquito repellent. One hand is sprayed with the repellent, the other is clean. The activity is determined by 10 landings and at least three stings. Well, in this case, there are already many more landings and many more stings. This indicates the activity of our mosquitoes. Now we'll place the sprayed hand with our active mosquitoes. The experiment lasts about three minutes. And we'll see that no mosquitoes even fly close to the sprayed hand. The repellent works well immediately after being applied. The test is not over yet. The hand will go into the grid with the mosquitoes every half hour until the repellent sprayed hand gets stung three times. This will mean that the protective agent is no longer active. Manufacturers are creating ever stronger substances to combat insects because the old formulas no longer work. Urban synthropic insects, those that live near a person, are more resistant because the human is constantly struggling and the insects are constantly adapting. No matter how harmful or dangerous insects are, we have something to learn from them. Despite their tiny size, in many ways, mosquitoes and cockroaches are much stronger than us. Their biological plasticity, the ability to change and adapt to any environment, presents scientists with new surprises. And to date, entomologists have not been able to reveal all the secrets of six-legged creatures. But perhaps it is their secrets of survival that will someday save mankind from extinction. <laughs>